So today uh, we are going to talk about um, tropical forest structure, looking at um, what is the physical structure of the rainforest ecosystems and um, what is the composition in terms of uh, life forms and uh, how we generally characterize the, the forest. And just a note on large scale uh, surveys of the vegetation structure and features. There has been uh, a lot of technological progress uh, on the remote sensing, uh, both from the satellites, but also from the planes, where um, we can look at the different spectral um, uh, images of the forest and then derived uh, um, uh, foliar composition, lignin, cellulose um, uh, elements, um, uh, concentration, also uh, biomass, growth rate. And then the holy grail would be um, uh, species identification of uh, trees uh, from the air. That would, of course, be a huge progress. But um, so far, we are not there yet. We would have to have uh, specific signatures for all the tree um, flora from a given region. And um, as far as I know, this hasn't happened yet. Um, one of the leading uh, teams is uh, Greg Asners uh, from, from the US, and they have this, uh, I would say, very cool plane with um, the remote sensing, uh, which is processed in real time on board of the, of the plane. So uh, that's kind of ecology I, uh, I like. Um, these are some of their uh, images. These are, um, uh, uh, of course, artificial colors uh, showing growth rates in, in uh, trees in Panama. Uh, this is uh, tree species signatures. So that's an attempt to, to, uh, to uh, look at the spectral profiles and, um, and uh, associate them with, with local uh, species of trees. And this is the evaluation of tree biomass in, in Colombian forest. Okay, now um, back to the earth. Um, we can uh, first have a look at what is the distribution of uh, uh, tropical rainforests across uh, three continents. And so this is the uh, this is the natural distribution, not taking into account uh, deforestation. And when you look at it, then there are several distinct um, biogeographical regions. Um, basically, in the neotropics, not counting uh, small uh, oceanic islands, which would be a, a different category on its own. Then we have we have Central uh, America, which um, has um, some forests in the lowlands and also high altitude. And then uh, this is a relatively recent area. Um, uh, which corresponds to the connection between Northern and South Southern uh, Americas, which, which is fairly recent. Then we have the huge area of the Amazon and then quite separate, um, uh, also in terms of species composition and evolution, the, the Atlantic forest, which is much more um, threatened uh, because the deforestation there is much more intense than, than in the whole Amazon. Uh, when we go to uh, Africa, then there are three principal regions. One is the um, Sierra Leone, um, Ivory Coast, uh, uh, Ghana uh, connection. Then there is a gap. And then we have the huge uh, Congo Basin forest, which, which is, not, which is uh, spreading across Nigeria, Cameroon, and then uh, Gabon, Democratic Republic of Congo and Congo Brazzaville. And then finally, we have the Madagascar rainforest. So Africa has a relatively a small percentage of uh, tropical zone in the rainforest area. And then uh, the opposite is true for the Southeast Asia Pacific region, where only India has a naturally um, uh, low distribution of the forests, where we have Western Ghats, and then also connection to, to Sri Lanka. And then we can see the entire Southeast Asia, uh, including the, the islands, the Philippines, Borneo, Sumatra, Java, as pretty much one region, because uh, these are um, islands which uh, tend to be connected with the, with the continent and then uh, disconnected again, depending on the level of the 
uh, uh, level of the uh, ocean. And then um, behind the Wallace line, we have uh, the New Guinea, um, Solomon Islands and, uh, and Northern Australia region. And as I said, uh, there are also some, some oceanic islands. Okay, uh, before we go further into geography, then uh, have a look at uh, a few features of um, uh, the uh, forest structure and also environment. Uh, we will start with uh, tropical soils. Uh, typically, um, when, when uh, somebody who is not really a um, soil specialist uh, starts talking about uh, soils or looking into soils, is discouraged by these highly colorful maps of a huge number of soil types uh, with uh, strange names. Uh, I like actually this second map, which is, which is um, a significant simplification of these maps and basically tells us that 90% um, of soil, soils in the tropics fall into two broad categories. One in red here are uh, highly weathered soils in hot rainy climate uh, with nutrient limitations, uh, 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 which pedologists call ultisols or oxisols. And then in green, we have uh, young to medium age soils with, with uh, moderate to high nutrients, antisols, insecticides. Okay, I think we will, we will stop there. And then when we look at um, the soil productivity, this is actually done for, <clears throat> for agriculture, but you can say this, this will be the same for the, for the forests. Uh, the limitation can be either, uh, either by soils or by climate. Of course, in the tropics, in the wet tropics, uh, the, the limitation by climate is rare. But when you look at the limitation, which is, which is blue colors, um, or yellow colors, uh, then for soils, it's actually widespread in the tropics. And so if you combine that uh, climate and soil limitation, then in the, in the tropical zone, um, uh, there is a much more severe uh, limitation on plant productivity than uh, certainly in the northern uh, temperate zone. And it's uh, mostly because of the dominance of oxisols and altisols, where they have high acidity, uh, aluminum toxicity, and then they are fairly deficient in basic uh, nutrients. And also um, these nutrients, when supplied, then they leach uh, from the soils uh, fairly quickly. Uh, for instance, uh, when we look at the Amazon, which is our first area we will be, we will be dealing with um, geographically, then there are four different um, uh, soil areas, uh, the Guayana Shield, which is highly weathered infertile soil, that's, that's the area one in blue, Brazilian Shield, again the same um, low nutrient soil, and then we have uh, the Western uh, Amazonia with more fertile and less weathered soils also coming from the Andes, and then um, Central Amazonia infertile sediments uh, deposited from the Guayana and Brazilian shields. So uh, these two shields are also source of these uh, of these low low value soils. Um, generally, in the tropical forests, um, uh, when we look at the nutrient limitation, then um, interestingly, the the nitrogen limitation, which we might sort of naively assume would be common, is actually fairly rare. The uh, tropical forests uh, have ability to uh, accumulate and recycle large quantities of nitrogen. And so when you look at the uh, nitrogen to um, phosphorus ratios, then, then there is a strong latitudinal gradient with high nitrogen ratio in the tropics. Um, part, of the, uh, part of the picture are nitrogen fixing trees where there was um, expectation then they will be particularly common uh, in uh, tropical areas, but uh, a recent study uh, two years ago, uh, which looked at the forest geoplots and the, the share of the uh, nitrogen fixing trees, then actually discovered that uh, there is a huge um, between continental difference uh, where, where the neotropics uh, do have a large share of nitrogen fixers, but not the uh, Asian Pacific area, and it can be easily explained uh, by, by differences in soil, uh, for instance, by lower nitrogen in the neotropics. Uh, basically, uh, 
in the situations where plant growth is limited by nutrients, then it is more often in tropical forests by phosphorus than, than uh, by nitrogen. Um, this has been tested also experimentally very easily. Of course, you can fertilize a tropical forest and see what happens. Uh, what happens either to plants or also to soil microbial activity because um, of course the nutrients are directly taken by plants um, and uh, define primary productivity but also um, they are processed by by uh, soil uh, microbiome and uh, also there is an interaction between between uh, microbes and plants and so we can also look at microbial activity and whether that is limited by nutrients or not um, generally, and this has been a meta-analysis of, of number of experiments in the special neotropics, but also, also uh, Asia, um, there are basically no overall effects of uh, fertilization by nitrogen uh, in the tropical soils um, uh, under the rainforests. Uh, however, there is an increase in activity after phosphorus uh, fertilization. And, uh, but there is no synergic effect. When we, when we look at the nitrogen plus phosphorus, then it's pretty much as the phosphorus alone. Uh, nitrogen uh, seems to be somehow limiting in high elevation. So, so there is an effect of elevation, but uh, generally um, we can conclude that nitrogen is, is actually not really limiting. Um, there has been also a study on phosphorus um, showing um, that uh, sometimes there is no actual limitation on uh, primary productivity, but there can be limitation on species composition. This is a natural uh, gradient in phosphorus um, by an order of magnitude in Panama. And so um, these are individual plots uh, studied um, for vegetation at different natural phosphorus concentrations in 32 communities. And uh, looking at uh, at growth rate of three species. So each point here is one three species at a given plot and uh, in, in red there are community-wide um, averages for growth rate and you can see that it's perfectly stable across uh, an order of magnitude uh, differences in phosphorus concentration. However, uh, the composition really changes and um, um, when you test uh, the uh, phosphorus uh, requirements of different tree species, then the uh, low phosphorus, the low phosphorus tolerant species are declining and, uh, and um, the uh, tolerant species are increasing. So there is almost complete change in uh, community structure. So, so there is a big effect of phosphorus on, on some trees, uh, three species, but not on the community overall. Uh, another study uh, again, uh, large uh, global analysis looked at um, the uh, connection between phosphorus and in soils and uh, primary productivity, and they did find a positive correlation, which would indicate that uh, phosphor might be limiting, but at the same time, um, that global correlation explains a very small percentage of above ground uh, net uh, primary productivity of plants. Now, when we look at um, the composition of uh, rainforest plots um, in the Amazon, that's where we will start, and try to explain it with um, different environmental factors, uh, then this was done by um, uh, with the huge um, uh, with the huge uh, data set by, by uh, Ter Stege and um, we already saw that in uh, uh, previous uh, previous uh, lectures where we looked at uh, high predominance of trees and uh, and species diversities in the Amazon uh, based on these more than uh, 1000 plots and so if you do uh, ordination of generic composition uh, of uh, three communities then they recovered basically two main uh, axes of variation and you have them here on the map. So these colors are, um, these are colors are first and second axis uh, ordination scores. And then um, these scores are correlated uh, primarily with soil fertility. So there is some effect of soil fertility overall on, on species composition again here. 
uh, in the Amazon. And then the second axis with the length of dry season. So, so these are the main uh, factors. And uh, interestingly, there are a lot of um, ecologically important gradients uh, in species traits, which goes with these uh, changes in species composition. So um, there is a uh, there is a trend of um, uh, decreasing uh, seed mass, um, uh, wood density. Um, there is also um, decline in ectomycorrhizal uh, uh, mutualism. Um, there is decline in the percentage of Fabaceae trees, which um, uh, again uh, is uh, related to some degree with uh, nitrogen fixing trees, but not enough to actually generate a gradient in these. And then with the other um, second axis, there is a clear gradient in alpha diversity in the communities. Um, so when we look at the first, uh, when we look at the first gradient, um, which uh, was attributed to soil fertility, um, then interestingly, when you look at the 10 most widespread uh, plant genera uh, in the Guayana shield, so that means at, uh, at one extreme of the gradient, and uh, in Western Amazonia, the other extreme, then uh, there is no overlap. Uh, this is the this is the ten um, genera in the Guayana Shield. Uh, there is absolutely uh, no overlap with Western Amazonia, and um, also the Guayana Shield uh, is dominated by Fabaceae, uh, by legumes. Seven of uh, ten genera are from that family. Um, then we can also characterize this gradient um, as we have seen as uh, increasing fertility and. Um, decreasing seed size, wood density, nitrogen fixing, ectomyer cohesi, and the um, Lots of these characteristics are also related to the dynamics of the forest, uh, how uh, high is the mortality, how the forest responds, um, the seed mass, um, the high disturbance uh, um, is uh, conductive to low seed mass, uh, the same goes uh, for recovery of vegetation for wood density, where, where you remember the uh, discussion of the secondary succession. And so there is generally a higher turnover uh, of individuals and higher productivity with the soil, soil fertility and, and higher dynamics of the forests in this uh, West Amazonia compared to Guayana Shield. The second gradient increasing um, abundance of drier forest. Um, then it goes with increasing abundance of some indicator species, which um, are preferring these dry conditions. And you have them here, uh, Bursaraceae, Bignoniaceae, Rutaceae, the main, main genera here. Um, when we look at these gradients, uh, this is, uh, this is um, again, the, the soil fertility, especially phosphorus here. Uh, that's the first gradient. When we compare these two gradients, then one in important issue is that the first one is probably very ancient because uh, it depends on uh, how old are the soils and um, that situation of, um, uh, of the general layout of the landscape um, and um, the, the Andes um, uh, being uplifted and then uh, the sediments being washed from there uh, and then the the Guayana shield, that's actually has been in place for more than 20 million years. So that's a very ancient gradient. While the uh, length of the dry season, um, we, can, we can reasonably expect that that's actually a very dynamic gradient, which can be changing you know, between the ice ages, uh, basically on the scale of tens of uh, uh, thousands of, of years, so much more, much more faster. Okay, now when we go uh, another, to another soil characteristics, and that is the carbon, a carbon um, reserve in soil, litter, and living plant biomass. There are contrasting uh, latitudinal trends. Uh, the carbon in soil is low in the tropics, and the highest reserves are in the peat, uh, in the, in the peat layers, and um, in the permafrost layers uh, in the northern temperate zone. That's the red color on this map. Uh, similar situation is in the litter, where again, uh, the fast decomposition in the tropics leaves no reserves. And then 
um, the complete opposite situation is in the living biomass where uh, here you have carbon stocks which are um, highest uh, in the uh, tropical rainforests very clearly and when you look at the living biomass by uh, by uh, vegetation types then and and the region then the the three highest uh, stocks are in the moist tropical forest uh, in the neotropics asia and africa and then then we have we have some other biomes uh, following Okay, now a little bit of uh, how we describe the uh, structure of tropical forest uh, and what are the parameters. These are some photographs from how we actually measure uh, this structure in the field, uh, uh, weighing, weighing leaves, uh, then uh, measuring the leaf area, uh, studying herbivory, uh, punching discs to, to look at specific, um, uh, specific leaf area and so on and so on. Um, you can also do it re uh, remotely on uh, less precisely, but over larger areas. This is the leaf area index for, for the whole um, South America. Again, from, uh, from the satellite um, measurements. And so you can see that for the Amazon forest, it's somewhere between five and seven. So that means there are between five and seven layers of leaves between the, the ground and the top of the canopy. Um, so what, uh, how, how we describe the forest, we can look at standing biomass uh, in tons per, per hectare, um, which includes, of course, uh, wood as well as, as leaves. Then we can look at basal area, which is um, a cross section of the stems um, of um, uh, all trees uh, and measured in square meters per hectare. Of course, number of stems, number of trees, which uh, depends uh, a lot, uh, obviously, on the minimum dBH. We, uh, we postulate this one, um, these statistics here are for 10 centimeters and above, which is standardized uh, size for when we, when we are talking about trees. Then annual mortality for these trees above uh, 10 centimeter dBH uh, between 1 and 2.3. Percent. We have discussed that before, leaf area index, I just explained. And then we can also look at the leaf fall and total litter fall, which includes also falling trees and branches in tons per hectare. Okay, now um, what uh, structures of the forest um, we have, which are typical uh, for, for that uh, ecosystem, as opposed to temperate zone, one is the emergent trees. Um, this is not a, a random situation where some tree simply happens to, to be above the canopy. These are specialized tree species which have this kind of lifestyle. Being emergent tree uh, has advantages and disadvantages. Obviously, there is a lot of sunlight. There is a lot of stress also from wind. Uh, there is uh, typically much higher load of epiphytes and sometimes lianas. Uh, there is higher danger of um, being... Uh, um, stricken by lightning, which actually is um, um, much uh, higher risk than, than you would expect. There is a lot of lightning in the tropics. And so uh, this, is a distinct, uh, this is a distinct strategy. And increasingly, um, uh, there is an indication that uh, huge trees in the, in, the, in the rainforest are disproportionately important. They have certain structural uh, habitats and microhabitats for epiphytes, uh, lianas, and then uh, vertebrates and, and invertebrates, which smaller trees or medium-sized trees don't have. They also are very important in terms of carbon stocks. And so, um, so the, the big trees, are, including the, the emergents, are a quite important part of the ecosystem. And um, regarding the, the highest trees in the tropical forest, um, these are not as, uh, as tall as uh, some of the temperate zones uh, trees. So the, forest, the tropical forests don't have the, the record um, in the, uh, at, at the height, but there are some, some records uh, shown from Indo-Pacific. It's Shorea, uh, here you have it, and then Divisia from the Neotropics and uh, um, uh, Entandrophragma from Africa, this of course can, can change and uh, it's between uh, 80 and 100 meters height. Another uh, typical tropical feature are buttresses. Uh, the name comes uh, from, from the 
human architecture and they they serve the same role of uh, supporting mechanically the tree um, there are often often shallow uh, soils and so the buttresses are especially um, used uh, in that situation and they are typically typical for lowland forests of course different forests differ um, uh, by, by representation of species with buttresses. Uh, these are some examples. You can measure so-called circularity of the trunk, uh, where one means that it's a perfect circle, and the more the, um, uh, the, more the um, uh, trunk perimeter is, uh, is departing from that perfect cir circle, then the, the circularity index uh, goes down. And so you can see these are some of the lowland forests with with different level of, uh, of buttresses in them. Um, also support roots um, and uh, stilt uh, roots. This is pandanus where the meristems are actually here and the, the uh, stilt roots are growing from top uh, down until they, until they meet, meet uh, the, the soil surface. This is um, uh, another uh, interesting type of roots, aerial roots. Uh, that's from plants which are starting their lifestyle as uh, epiphytes and then sending the roots uh, all the way from the canopy to uh, reach the soil. So uh, you can't really see it well, but this, this is the, the terminal part of the aerial roots, which goes all the way from the canopy here and then finally Will, um, will be anchored in, in soil. And then finally leaves. Uh, for, the, for the primary forests, um, the leaves are typically small. Uh, botanists have this uh, classification um, uh, from nanophyll to megaphyll leaves. So notophyll or mesophyll, this is the, the size which, which is typical uh, for, for tropical forests. So that means um, somewhere between um, 20 and 45 square centimeters is the category for notophils. Um, this is a difference from the early successional stage, which as we have discussed is characterized by, uh, by much larger leaves. That of course doesn't uh, mean that there are no giant leaves uh, in the tropical forests. Uh, they are, and um, here I would um, quote my favorite uh, tropical botanist, um, uh, E.J.H. Conner, who uh, once noted that botany needs the big plants of the tropics to endanger uh, big ideas. By the way, Conner is a um, um, quite colorful uh, character and uh, who likes uh, biogeographies, I would recommend uh, reading uh, one which uh, is called um, My Father in His Suitcase, and that was written by his son John. Um, he actually got into argument with his father when he was 19 years old and then um, father refused to um, uh, speak to him for the next uh, 36 years until he died. And But then um, despite that he was collecting all kinds of materials, documents and memorabilia about his life uh, in a suitcase for his son and so after uh, Connor died then his son actually discovered that suitcase and based on these materials wrote a biography about his father. So you can see that he was not uh, probably the easiest of characters, but um, um, he's, uh, he's the last generation of uh, um, uh, colonial botanists. Uh, he, he started as uh, 23 years old uh, as the deputy director of the botanical gardens in Singapore, which was then um, the uh, the position of the British Colonial Service, and um, he was famous by training monkeys to uh, collect botanical specimens from the from the tree canopy. And he describes that they were actually very efficient in that. Um, um, but um, if uh, you ask them uh, to recollect from the same tree, then they they got upset. They they really had a sense that uh, that means they didn't do their job properly, which sometimes was the, was the case because they ate a part of the botanical specimens on their way down from the canopy, but, uh, but then they got upset. Anyway, this was a success, uh, but uh, before the Second World War, when 
um, the Japanese were actually coming for Singapore, then uh, then Condor enrolled into volunteer uh, defense uh, service, uh, but couldn't really take the, the, the position because just before um, uh, Japanese came that one of his monkeys actually bite him very, very severely into his arm. So, so that sort of um, incapacitated coroner for, for the Second World War. And um, he was actually uh, uh, allowed by Japanese to stay in his position at the botanical garden with the task of um, uh, looking after the scientific collections so that um, uh, they are not looted and they are not damaged. And that was approved by Japanese um, emperor uh, who was actually um, a very keen orchid collector. And so, so Conrad actually wrote to the Japanese and, and the, the uh, emperor gave him this permission. But of course, uh, that caused a lot of bad blood with uh, other his colleagues uh, who were, uh, who were you know, incarcerated in war camps uh, under uh, often very bad conditions. So, so um, that was that was quite difficult. And then uh, Conner is uh, was world authority on ficus, and so his sort of uh, life uh, work was also a revision of uh, of the ficus. And um, again, um, he was it was supposed to be published in Flora Malaysiana, but uh, he got into conflict with the editor of the Flora Malaysiana, and uh, um, so. Uh, there were letters uh, where the two gentlemen were swearing at each other uh, in, Mal in Malay. Um, that was at least uh, witnessed by their students um, uh, in Malay. It's not really surprising because um, the editor was actually Dutch and he was uh, in colonial service as well, but in the Dutch East Indies. So this was in the 1970s, but it was basically one of the last uh, colonial botanical conflicts between between the Dutch and the British. And um, so um, this conflict uh, delayed um, delayed uh, the publication of the revision by by 32 years after Connor died in uh, 1996. Then a then, uh, few years later, it was finally published. So <coughs> sorry, um, this was a bit of a digression, but but um, he was definitely an interesting character. So, okay, back to the tropical forests. So, now regarding structure, um, we have to also consider um, the life forms. Uh, this is just a reminder of the slide you already seen, where we said that uh, one third of um, the plant species in New Guinea, but also elsewhere, uh, are parasites, either epiphytes or lianas. So, I think this, uh, this is a very interesting phenomenon we should look uh, more closely uh, at. And so well, let's start with lianas um, uh, or generally climbers. Uh, they can be herbaceous or woody. When you look at the 50 hectare plot in, in uh, Barro, Colorado, then it's one of the few which actually uh, surveys also lianas. Why is that? Well, Lianas are really extremely difficult to survey for botanical plots. The, uh, the explanation is in this sketch. You, you can see here, um, each color is a different individual liana, but um, they are, you know, only very few of them are behaving well, uh, being rooted once and then going up to the canopy so that they can be properly measured, uh, um, uh, you know, DBH and, and that's it. Some of them, go up to the canopy, then they return, they can have secondary rooting, uh, then they go up again. Uh, of course, they can also branch. Um, and, um, and so it's, uh, it's very difficult to, de to decide what is uh, an individual in, in lianas when you are surveying a uh, live forest in the plot. Um, but at the same time, there is a lot of lianas. You can see all these uh, blue, um, uh, dots are individual lianas uh, at uh, the 50 hectare plot, and uh, the red ones are secondary secondary stems of uh, of lianas. When you look at um, the number of species, this is the distribution of um, uh, Barro Colorado trees in red, uh, from the most common one um, uh, dominance on logarithmic scale, going to the to the 
to the rarest one and sorry and uh, for the trees with one centimeter dbh and five centimeter in in black is the same for lianas so of course there are fewer lianas than trees but um, you can see that while there are about um, uh, slightly less than 300 species of uh, trees with one centimeter dbh then there are about 100 60 species of lianas. So lianas are very important uh, part of the forest uh, forest biodiversity. Um, the liana lifestyle originates um, very frequently uh, across the whole plant phylogeny. So, so there are some morphologically distinct types of lianas, uh, again, originating across the phylogeny. And um, lianas basically, it's a pipe. It's a, it's a basically pipe delivering uh, water uh, for, um, for transpiration and for photosynthesis. Uh, that's after all why um, you can see in the films from the tropical forest that people are cutting the lianas and drinking for them, uh, which doesn't really work for, for trees or shrubs. And uh, this is the morphological reason for that. This uh, Dalbergia frutescens uh, is one of the species which are very, which are quite flexible. Uh, they, it can be a tree or liana. And so when you look at the uh, at the xylem uh, for the individuals which in the from the same location, which are trees and lianas, you can already see visually difference, much bigger uh, trache for 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 the liana. Um, of course, lianas have to hold on their host, and there are a number of morphological adaptations for that. Uh, this is a survey from a number of tropical locations, and there are some basic ways how to do it. Um, you have um, most often is twinning, which is basically um, uh, just coiling around the, the host, uh, host stem. Um, then tendrils, these can be modified stems, leaves or petioles. This is an example how it looks like. Um, scrambling is basically no, no morphological adaptation, just plant is sort of covering the host and, and you know, hoping to hold on it. And there can be also spines and hooks, uh, as you can see here in the picture, and adventitious roots uh, as, as shown here on this uh, vanilla plant. So, so there are all these numbers of adaptations and uh, they, they representation in the tropical floras. Now, when we look at the, at the population dynamics and um, the, the abundance of lianas, then as with other parasites, we, we can look at the parasite host interactions and we can look at not only population dynamics of lianas, but also their, their impact on their host. And so for that, there are several uh, useful, useful um, uh, variables we can define. First is prevalence, which is a proportion of infected trees. Uh, there are uh, some empirical data from Barra Colorado plot uh, for 33 host tree species. And so there is an average prevalence. So that means that uh, among these 33 species, uh, approximately 70% of individual trees uh, were um, um, uh, hosting lianas. Okay, then load means um, uh, the liana co cover of infested trees. It's usually measured as the leaf area. And so again, the average load was about 45%. Uh, so the, the leaf cover was 45% on lianas, quite high. Um, Tolerance is the change in host tree um, per capita population growth per unit of liana cover. So, so that is the that is really the impact of lianas. Um, and uh, as you can see, it's uniformly negative. Lianas are really inconveniencing the trees, and uh, again, can be of different degree. And then burden is total impact of lianas on the per capita population growth rate. Um, the difference from tolerance is that some of the three, this is at the population wide average, including trees which are not attacked. So when we apply these, uh, these characteristics, then uh, we can have um, liana colonization rate of host trees. So there is certain rate how lianas are colonizing the trees, but also there is some, some liana loss. Sometimes lianas die uh, before the host tree or the branch 
um, uh, which is supporting Liana breaks and that makes uh, the whole tree free of Liana. So there is also Liana loss rate. And then um, there is um, a response of the tree to Liana cover. cover. Some trees might have higher mortality and therefore uh, the Liana colonization can be high, but if also the hosts are dying fast, then, then still the prevalence might be low. So when we have all these three factors, uh, then together, that means colonization, loss, and the, uh, the mortality of hosts, then we will get, we will get the, the prevalence. Okay, further, when we look at the, the response of the host and to uh, in, in survival, then we also um, look at the response in the growth rate and in the fecundity, uh, that, which is basically the main definition of fitness. Then um, all these together uh, defines the response of three per capita population growth to, to Liana cover, and which is which is um, which is tolerance that's indicated by tolerance, and then. Um, the <clears throat> Liana growth rate within host trees and then all the colonization and loss rate and response of tree survival uh, defines the distribution of Liana cover over infested trees and that is uh, indicated by load. And finally, um, the tolerance and, and load and prevalence goes to define the final uh, important variable which is burden. So, so this is a little bit of um, dynamics of, of Liana attack and these are some empirical data again based on the Barro Colorado. This is the 33 trees we have and they are ranked by the Liana burden. So that's the difference uh, in the per capita population growth between, between current condition of Liana infestation and Liana free conditions which again can be measured and so you can see that there are trees which are impacted uh, heavily and then there are trees which can, can tolerate Liana infestation. Uh, this is another variable. This is the difference between current infestation and the heavy infestation, the, the maximum infestation. And you see that there is still uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, potential for li Lianas to have worse impact than they have. Um, uh, because this is all, uh, this, is, this is at least two thirds of species which will be impacted by, by uh, heavy Liana cover. And now uh, when we leave the Barro Colorado, these are, this is a meta-analysis of prevalence of uh, Lianas in different forests. So every line is a different forest and the number in brackets is um, the three species con considered. And so when we look at a broad pattern, of course, not surprisingly, there is a lot of var variability, but we can say that on average, we have about 50% of uh, trees in tropical forests are attacked by, by lianas. Now, lianas are harmful to host trees. There has been actually done quite a bit of liana removal experiments. That's a fairly fairly easy experiment. You just cut you just cut the lianas uh, from the trees. It's done often on the forest regeneration after logging because these uh, vegetation types are heavily infected by lianas, but also in natural forests. And um, all the liana removal experiments, and there is a recently uh, there is a recent review of of them, um, uh, caused. Um, um, Caused uh, increase in tree survival, so that means that lianas are really, uh, really a mortality factor. Uh, there is a more um, sophisticated study uh, which which is shown here, looking at the trees which are liana free, and then uh, four different levels of liana cover, and uh, these are measuring. Uh, different impacts of lianas on trees of different sizes. So these are DBH of trees and we are looking at probability of reproduction, flowering fruiting in a given year. And so here we can see that, that the heavy liana uh, infestation is, is the only one which has serious impacts, although mild impacts are, are also for the other categories. Proportion of crown 
bearing fruit, which is approximately um, the reproductive output of the tree. Um, then uh, the growth rate of the trees. So um, in, in this case, again, the green line is on the top, so that's fastest growth. And then uh, although here the relationship with tree size is, is not uniform, and then survival rate in 10 years, again, especially for larger trees and especially for heavy liana, uh, heavy liana cover. So, so there are clear signs that lianas are very important. Um, uh, they are basically virulent. Yeah, we had, um, when we think of uh, parasites and virulence is how it damages the host. When we look at some statistics from the Amazon forests, um, uh, there, um, the large lianas represent um, the bulk of biomass, the same as, as for trees. And interestingly, uh, lianas are more dynamic than the trees. They have higher mortality, five to eight percent. While you can remember that uh, we just said that lowland forests overall have somewhere between one and uh, two point something percent of mortality. So lianas actually um, uh, turnover of lianas is much faster than their host trees. And um, in the Amazon, liana infested large trees are three times more likely to die than than liana free trees and. Um, at least one third of the death of tree um, might have been uh, at least contributed to by lianas according to this, this measurement. So, so much for lianas. Now let's move to epiphytes. Um, there are two prominent examples, uh, Southeast Asian Asplenium ferns and uh, the bromelias from the neotropics. Epiphytic loads can be very heavy, um, especially at high elevations. Um, uh, epiphytes are basically um, uh, growing uh, in arid environment. It's basically environment which has no contact with soil and that's why they are sensitive to humidity and uh, preferring highly humid, higher elevations. Um, there are epiphytes which can uh, create uh, you know, heavy carpets on the uh, branches and trunks, but also on the surface of leaves, so-called epiphylls, which is typically uh, mosses and uh, all, all lichens. Um, some of the mosses can create several centimeters or tens of centimeters even thick carpets on the on the um, trunks and branches at the mountain forest, which can cause actually a lot of problems for the host trees because these um, uh, moss carpets are soaked with water and so can be very heavy burden on the host trees. Now, when we look at the epiphytic uh, diversity patterns, then there is a proportion of terrestrial as opposed to epiphytic uh, plants uh, with latitude. So we can see that not surprisingly, tropics are uh, more favorable to epiphytes, but um, it's actually um, 25% of all plant diversity, which is epiphytic. So it's, it's very prominent. And here is the um, species diversity of epiphytes, which again, you can see is mostly concentrated in the tall, humid tropical mountains in and the Andes and, and New Guinea. Um, when you look at the distribution of different families, then, you know, there can be different patterns. RAC as clearly um, a single global maximum, then bromeliaceae are exclusively the neo neotropical. Um, uh, orchids are much more widespread uh, with high diversity everywhere except Africa. However, uh, these families are contributing in different degree. When you look at the, um, uh, the numbers of species for the top category that it's 750 for orchids, 400 for bromeliads, and then less than 100 for everybody else. So this global pattern is really driven by combination of orchids and bromeliads. When we look at the global plant uh, flora, then there has been recently a paper listing uh, all the epiphytes and there were 27,614 of them, which represents 9% of the global plant diversity. And there were 73 families, which included some epiphytes. And this is the percentage of epiphytes for 
all families with at least 500 species or families with at least 100 epiphytic species. So um, wherever a family is large or have large number of epiphytes, it's here. And you can see that there are some ferns like Polypodiaceae and then orchids and bromelias, which are uh, uh, dominated by epiphytes, but there are actually not so many families which are uh, which are completely overhanged by epiphytes. It's a minority of them. Uh, this is the plant uh, phylogeny and number of epiphytes in different lineages. Details are not important. This is just to show that epiphytic lifestyle happens independently, repeatedly across a uh, whole plant phylogeny. And these are the proportion of epiphytes in all the 73 families where there is at least one epiphytic species. For the um, lowest proportion, this is on logarithmic scale, that's Poaceae, where they, the family has more than 10,000 species and one of them is epiphytic. But then on the other hand, there are only three small families which are 100% epiphytic. Otherwise, the median value for the proportion, proportion of epiphytes in, a, in the family are 3%. So epiphytic lifestyle is a minority, minority lifestyle in most of the families. When we look at uh, families um, um, dominating epiphytes, we already know that it's orchids, but it, you know, it's uh, useful to see how hugely dominant are they compared to uh, all other families. When we look at this distribution on the logarithmic scale, so we can see the details, then we have orchids, bromelias, polypodiaceae, piperaceae, ericaceae, and so on and so on. Um, these are top families at different uh, neotropical locations. Uh, details are not important, but we just see that the pattern is always the same. They are ranked in the same order, as you can see here, and visually, this ranking is pretty much consistent between sites, which does not apply to a generic uh, composition, as you can see. Um, epiphytes colonize many trees. These are different locations, uh, different studies with percentage of trees with epiphytes. And um, so they can be, they can be again, sometimes very low, but sometimes uh, well above 50% of all trees. And then also the epiphytes can represent a different share of the foliage up to remarkably high um, values. Now, when we look at the individual tree size and then the epiphyte biomass on them, then this is the conspecific individual trees for, for uh, Eucryphia cordifolia from, from Chile. You can see that there is a disproportionate increase in epiphytic biomass with tree size. So the especially large trees are especially vulnerable to epiphytes. The same goes for interspecific uh, comparison. There are 22 different species uh, in Panama with their average size and uh, epiphytic um, uh, biomass. And again, you can see this proportionate increase for large trees. And so they just, we don't uh, talk about bar graphs. These are uh, epiphytes from a single epiphytic community on the Virola Koshni in La Selva, which is the lowland neotropical forest. And there are some examples of different uh, types or taxa of epiphytes. There are aroids, for example, uh, bromelias um, are divided into so-called atmospheric. These have um, roots which are absorbing uh, directly the, the air humidity. And then so-called tank bromelias, which have a rosette of leaves, which is creating a, a water, a stagnant pool of water, so a so-called tank. So there are three examples of this. Then there are ferns, uh, cacti, that's interesting, also epiphytic cacti, cyclantaceae, gesneraceae, of course, orchids, and then piper, and then ferns again. So, so these are examples of epiphytic fauna. Um, the, three-dimensional distribution of epiphytes and, and good surveys of epiphytes in the plots are extremely rare because, of course, it takes a lot of tree climbing to, to get systematic sampling of epiphytes. Canopy cranes are much better tool for that. And so this is three-dimensional study of epiphytes in Suromoni canopy crane in Venezuela. That's um, 
a crane which unfortunately was in operation only a few years before it was shut down. It was um, um, set up by um, a group of German and um, Austrian scientists, but then they got into some kind of conflict with Venezuelan government. That was a long time ago. That was before the current socialist experiment of Venezuela. Uh, but even then, um, there was some kind of conflict and so crane was shut down, but it was in a very remote place. And it was actually uh, running along the, the uh, rails, 100 meter long. So it had actually quite large area accessible of the forest. And so there is a mapping of the epiphytes. The same uh, happened at the San Lorenzo canopy crane in Panama, which is still operational. And so again, you can see the distribution of epiphytes around the crane perimeter. On big trees, we can distinguish several zones, uh, which are sort of distinct habitat. There is a, a, a spatial separation of different epiphytic species. There is, from Suramoni crane, there is such a approximate um, uh, uh, graph showing these different, um, different epiphytic genera. Um, as we already mentioned, epiphytes can be quite species diverse and they can represent on the community level um, uh, a significant portion of the diversity, likewise as, as lianas. In this case, there are three different communities uh, in, uh, in the neotropics and um, they, as an example, represent between 30 and 45% of all plant diversity are epiphytic. This is also species accumulation curve of epiphytes uh, only after 20 host trees, we already have 150 different species of epiphytes. When we look at the, this is an elevation gradient of epiphytic ferns, and there we can clearly see in green that compared to terrestrial ones, they, they are preferring higher elevations. This is the latitudinal gradient from, from the subtropics uh, to, the, to the equatorial tropics. Now, when we, when we talk about uh, ecophysiology, then epiphytes are living in quite extreme environment. And that is because uh, without soil, they have uh, limited access to nutrients and water. And so that's why epiphytes represent an extreme end of the leaf economic spectrum, which we discussed previously with the leaves, which are having low photosynthetic capacity, uh, low content of nitrogen and phosphorus um, are built very solidly. They have a high uh, leaf mass per area and then therefore a long lifespan. So these epiphytes are very slow growing and um, whatever is biomass they create is very well protected from herbivores because it's very valuable biomass considering the poor conditions they grow in. So uh, this is example of leaf nitrogen for epiphytes and terrestrial plants um, uh, across the gradient of uh, leaf uh, mass area. So you can see that epiphytes are always on the lower side for the nitrogen. The same goes for the growth rate, uh, especially com compared to herbaceous plants. And they are extremely well defended from, uh, from herbivores. So these are um, herbivory damage uh, values for ferns, uh, epiphytic ferns, orchid and bromelias. And basically, except for ferns, we can conclude that nothing eats uh, orchids or bromelias. Th these are the number of individual plants examined. So you can see these are hundreds for orchids and still we are at, at zero average uh, plant damage. We can confirm that in New Guinea, where we surveyed hundreds of orchids and basically found no herbivores. So that, that shows that if you are really serious about protecting your leaves from herbivores, you can actually invest heavily and you can actually do it. But how, how costly it is, that's another matter for epiphytes, certainly orchids and bromelias, it's certainly worth, worth the effort. And so that's why nothing basically eats them. Now for the uh, morphological adaptation, um, the epiphytic lifestyle um, has uh, the absorption layer on the, uh, on the roots of orchids, so-called uh, so velamen. You can see it on the outer layer here, um, which is absorbing the, the humidity from the air. Um, another 
already mentioned, uh, adaptation for keeping water is the phytothelmata, again, typical for, for bromeliads. And then finally, we have CM, uh, CAM photosynthesis, which is um, so-called crassulacean acid metabolism, which is primarily um, uh, invention of desert uh, plants, but uh, it comes handy uh, for epiphytes, especially when they grow with the areas with smaller rainfall. As is shown here, was when the, the proportion of CAM uh, bromeliads is decreasing with, with increasing rainfall. And um, that CMM um, uh, metabolism is basically conserving water during photosynthesis because the, um, the stomata are shut in the day to, to reduce evapotranspiration and um, they are open at night when, when carbon dioxide can get inside the plant. And then there is chemically stored as, as malate and transport to chloroplast during the day. And so the photosynthesis can happen while stomata are, are still closed. Now, these um, uh, bromelia tanks uh, also host um, entire food webs, uh, starting from primary producers, algae, uh, and then there are ciliates, uh, there are protozoans eating them, there are detritivores, um, uh, there is the whole um, level of, uh, of herbivores, and, um, and then also predators, including some of the mayflies and, and other predators, and also, also uh, the mosquito larvae. So that entire community up in the canopy. Uh, likewise, when we look at the uh, asplenium ferns, then they have suspended soils. They, the uh, degradation, decomposition of plant material, their own material, but also these rosettes are capturing falling leaves and other um, plant material and then it's, uh, it's decomposed into suspended soil and that hosts a lot of uh, invertebrates. And so there, uh, there was a study by Elwood and Foster some years ago where the title says it all. Um, it says doubling the estimate of invertebrate biomass in a rainforest canopy by looking at this asplenium. So there is uh, as much um, biomass and numbers of invertebrates living in this asplenium as in the entire rest of the tree. And these are, as you can see here, these are mostly ants and uh, termites, but also other groups of on in invertebrates compared with completely different taxonomic structure for, for the uh, invertebrates on the leaves.